different from the rest of the world. Okay, so please settle down. Please settle down. And because we're going to want to start the program. And uh, welcome to Nebel Proctor Marxist Library. Um, and this is a program of Institute for the Critical Study of Society, which hosts this program here. As you know, none of you really need this introduction since you are here. David Ewing is our speaker today, and he's speaking on class struggle in Chinatown. And I'm, without taking his time, I'm going to ask David to please start. And it's going to be about 45 minutes or an hour, uh, something like that. Okay. And then there'll be a cute question answer, as usual. We got an hour and 45 minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is that okay? Hold it like that. I have to hold the microphone like this. Okay. Um, San Francisco Chinatown, of course, is one of the largest uh, Chinese communities in the New World and um, outside of China, even in other places. It's still a pretty large community. And San Francisco figured pretty prominently into any kind of world orientation towards the workers' movement. San Francisco fits in as a pretty important place because it's a port, major city of U.S. imperialism, military center, so on and so forth. So San Francisco, Chinatown was important for many, many reasons. Um, in the 1930s, um, the Comintern especially uh, was concerned with, in the beginning of the 30s, mid-30s, there was a civil war taking place in China. Japan was moving towards fascism. And uh, so the Asian communist movement was very, very important. Um, the uh, Comintern recruited people in San Francisco to work uh, in international, their international fronts, um, RILU, the Red Labor Union International. Actually, Earl Browder uh, was the leader of the Asian, the specific, I should get the exact title. Um, he was political secretary of the Comintern's Far Eastern Bureau in Shanghai in 1927. Uh, other prominent Americans um, worked, uh, Eugene Dennis, who was later, these are both, people know, they probably know that Earl Browder was party leader. Okay. Earl Browder was, uh, talk right into, okay. I'll try. Thank you. Um, Earl Browder, of course, was leader of the Communist Party USA for, um, for many years. He was uh, sort of a... Um, Karen Lazowski uh, pointy to the common turn. Um, and then uh, Eugene Dennis uh, became important after the, in the chaos following the 1956 Stalin resolutions in Russia. Um, he led the party in a very difficult, very difficult circumstances. Eugene Dennis played an important role in what was called the Pan Pacific Trade Union. Have people heard of that before? The Pan Pacific Trade Union. Um, it was a workers front uh, to try and influence and reach workers in Japan uh, during that period of rising fascism in Japan. Um, the uh, Comintern really had no effective way uh, to reach Japan because the nearest important Soviet city was Vladivostok. But the uh, counterintelligence, the Japanese counterintelligence service was very active. They controlled northern China, and their intelligence service was very active and very effective. So there was no way that the that, um, communist propaganda and um, appeals to the Japanese working class could reach Japan. So to defeat this, the Comintern relied on his trade union sections, principally seamen and longshore. So the main task of Earl Browder in Shanghai was to try and organize propaganda to reach uh, workers in Japan. And so they used sailors. They used merchant seamen. Um, they used those unions, which were under, many were under some communist influence, like, for example, in the USA. And they were able to use seamen to carry in propaganda messages, 
greetings, measures to support some money, things like that, to help the underground uh, workers' movement in Japan. And uh, the other key city besides Shanghai was San Francisco. San Francisco was an important commentary center for the Pan Pacific Trade Union. Many uh, CPUSA uh, higher ranking cadres worked worked for them. But you know, you would be assigned. You could be assigned anywhere. You know, if you were working for the Pan Pacific Trade Union, you know, your workers and your personnel might be assigned to China, anywhere that you were needed. So it was a, a pretty important initiative that ended. Um, when the war began, when the, when the uh, Second World War really took off. Um, another important uh, organization was the, this was more of a mass uh, from the bottom up or, organization. It's called the, uh, it's called the Chinese Workers Mutual Aid Association. And it started in New York City, but there were strong uh, workers organizations in Chinatown too. Uh, in the 1930s, in the 1930s, before the United, before the Kuomintang and CCP United Front took place in the in the 40s, there was an intense rivalry over the the civil war in China, in Chinatown, and the communists were in the were in a very great minority. Um, but there were people who understood. The truth about China was getting out the revolutionary achievements of the Chinese Communist Party in the 30s was coming out. You know, the Red Star over China, journalists were writing about it. So that was an important, um, an important source of news and information for people in Chinatowns, in New York and San Francisco. And so many people were drawn into the international work uh, of communism. Some were recruited, some um, uh, gave money. Uh, one of the more humorous thing, I guess, is that the New York Laundrymen's Association actually donated an ambulance. Which the, association? The uh, Chinese Workers Mutual Aid Association in New York City. They raised money for an ambulance and they shipped it to China. And it went, it got all the way to Yan'an, which is pretty far, pretty far west into China where the red base was in Yan'an in the 30s, and it became Mao's staff car. <laughs> so the, the the workers' ambulance they, it became Mao's staff car during the 1930s. So many famous people had ridden in Mao's staff car. Um, kind of a funny thing. Um, the, there is an organization in San Francisco that was really based on um, a series of really effective and successful strikes in the Alaskan canneries, where there are, there are large numbers of Chinese workers. And so because the strikes were a very big success, uh, had a big impact in Chinese communities, not just in Alaska, but here, and many of the organizers from the Alaska camp, organizing campaign came to San Francisco and began organizing sort of um, pro-China um, uh, organizations that broke the the blockade of information about what was happening in China. Um, they printed the first Chinese editions of Mao's essays in the USA. Uh, they um, did uh, uh, they did education an education series in Chinatown about the history of Marxism, about the Chinese Revolution. Um, they were very active in in the labor movement in San Francisco. And at this time, of course, the Communist Party had very important ties with all these organizations. And they were always opposed by the Kuomintang. Before the United Front period, they were very they were much opposed by the uh, Kuomintang. Um, um, the next part of the story is kind of World War II period. Um, after 1939, when uh, the US, US entered in 41, but uh, the by 1942, the Soviet Union was back and was in the war. Uh, so the 40s was a period where um, once the U.S. entered the war, a lot of the pressure against the communists kind of went away. Um, uh, Earl Bradder had been was arrested in um, around 1940 or so um, because Roosevelt was very upset with um, the German, the, the German-Russian 
a pact that, that they signed. So Roosevelt was angry about that, so he arrested Browder. <laughs> Browder had used a false passport. All communists have to do that, unfortunately. But Browder used a false passport to visit Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And so they were able to, to get him on that, and he served, I don't know, nine months in jail or so. But then, he had lucky timing for him, Pearl Harbor took place after he was in jail, and so Roosevelt let him out. It wasn't his uh, fault. Yeah, huh? It wasn't his fault. <laughs> no, it wasn't his fault. So uh, anyway, so he got out. He's only served about nine months, and uh, you know, to because of the new American Soviet alliance, they let Earl Browder got out. So that was good for Earl. Um, there were um, Americans um, assigned to Asia. One was that people know Agnes Smedley. Yeah, Agnes Medley was one of the people working in Shanghai. And um, among the kind of stuff that then, one of the things that they were working on is that, you know, there was an important focus on Japan uh, because of the danger of a Japanese entry in the war against Russia. And also because of the, the role that uh, the war against China, against the, the uh, Chinese um, communist leadership, the people's movement in China. So there is a lot of interest on that. And um, so people like... Uh, People who uh, like, like um, Smedley um, and other Americans um, uh, were assigned there. Uh, and there was a whole group of international type people working in Shanghai, Germans and all kinds of people. Uh, one of them uh, was um, Sorge, uh, who was a, uh, who had uh, infiltrated the Nazi party. He'd been a, an important communist in Germany. He infiltrated the Nazi party and uh, was doing underground work, doing espionage against Germany. And so he was assigned to Shanghai the same time that uh, uh, Agnes Smedley was there. He was, it was, um, he was Smedley's boyfriend for a time. And uh, Seward eventually uh, was able to get to Tokyo. And he um, was, a, by then he had pretty good cover as a Nazi. He had pretty good cover. So he sort of ingratiated himself uh, with the um, uh, staff at the German embassy in uh, Tokyo. And he uh, became sort of a regular on the invitation list to come to events. He became more and more accepted and popular at the embassy. He began sleeping with the ambassador's wife. So he was easy for him to, he would come to the embassy when it was closed. And the guards would go, oh, it's just, oh, okay, you know. So they would know what was going on. They would let him in at night. So he would go upstairs and photo, just photograph every single secret document that they had in the embassy. And then, <clears throat> S-O-R-G-E. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, he actually, uh, before the, the attack on the Soviet Union, he actually was able to get um, the order of battle for the German army and, and transmitted that to, to, the, to Moscow. So that you know, but the Russians didn't necessarily believe it. That it could have been a provocation. That, anyway, they didn't. They missed an opportunity to act on that information. But there, the Chinese communists also had their own intelligence people. They knew about it too. They they had information. They they tried to warn Moscow too that they, from their own sources, they thought there would be an attack by the Germans pretty soon. So a lot of important, interesting people, um, and then of course the. The U.S., uh, Japan was defeated, Germany was defeated, um, and then there's this difficult period between 1945 and the beginning of the Red Scare. In some respects, the Red Scare really began in, in the U.S., really began in 1945. Um, there were a group of State Department personnel who had been assigned to China in the 1930s, and they're called, they're called the China Hands by historians who talk about that period. There are a number of American advisors working for FDR uh, in China because the war was going so badly in China. World War II was being handled so incredibly poorly. The, uh, uh, the Guomindang army out, never outnumbered the Japanese less than 10 to 1. They always had a 10 to 1 advantage. The only battles they ever won, the first battle they won was well, where there's a battle between Lin Biao a communist general, 
and a smaller Japanese unit. He, they just kind of destroyed, destroyed the, the Japanese unit, wiped it out. It was the first time that ever happened in the war. So the first battle was won by the communists. The Guomindang, the way the Guomindang army was organized, they couldn't fight because the Americans paid the paid the all the expenses for the Chinese army under Chiang Kai-shek. And what they did was every general got paid two dollars a month for his soldiers. And that would, in Chinese currency at the time, that was enough to sort of feed people and give them elementary basic clothing, maybe not arm them. And then they got armed separately from the Americans. So, you know, if you were a general and you had, you know, 10,000 soldiers, that meant you got $20,000 a month in your Swiss bank account. But if your army went into battle, if your unit went into battle and half of them were killed, the next month you got 10,000. So there was no incentive for the Guomindang army to fight. And the, politically, the way the Guomindang party was organized was by all these deals and between the generals and Chiang Kai-shek. Parts of the Guomindang army were pro-Japanese, parts were British, pro-British, parts were pro-American. And the American advisors to China, especially the American military advisors, Stillwell from San Francisco, Stillwell was completely frustrated by the inability of the Guomindang, despite all the money they were getting, to do any fighting. And he was, so Stillwell began, in the, during World War II, there was a, towards the end, there was a campaign in Burma, far from Beijing, but in Burma on the border with India. There were powerful Japanese units there, but they were quite small. And the, again, there were Chinese soldiers there. There were Indian soldiers under, the Brit under British command. But the Indian soldiers had their own problems with British imperialism and were not the most reliable soldiers. They had 20, 30,000 Indian soldiers, but they were not that reliable in battle against the Japanese. Japanese soldiers were extremely high quality. So that, you know, if you, if the, there was a, a in a, any kind of battle, the Japanese would do a bonze, would just charge right at you, and they would just kill everybody. They were just, if when you saw the Japanese coming, your only hope was really either you'd, you'd try and shoot them and stop them or run away. But people would panic because they knew that when the soldiers got through, they were going to kill everybody. So the, the Chinese army would generally throw down its guns and run away when there was a, a, a much smaller Japanese force would attack because they're very high quality soldiers. So, uh, Stillwell was trying to put together an American style unit, but he needed Chinese soldiers. So, Chiang Kai shek would demand money and, okay, we'll fly some over the hump to you. And so, well, but you got to pay for this. And so, the Chinese, the political advisors to Roosevelt in China were very frustrated by the amount of money demanded by Chiang Kai shek. They, everyone, everyone wanted to do this campaign against the Japanese in Burma. And they just couldn't, they wouldn't make it happen in Chongqing. So in Chongqing, the capital, wartime capital under Chiang Kai-shek, they just couldn't, he just wouldn't do it. He did, his generals wouldn't do it. So eventually the Americans decided that they would pay for everything. So they, they would fly them over the hump, they would feed them, they would do everything. So, you know, it's a pretty high altitude flight over the Himalayas to get down into, into sea level Burma. So when they, when finally Chiang Kai-shek agreed to put, to do this, they would, Americans would line up the airplanes on the airfield, they would bring the Chinese soldiers out, and they would just strip them naked, maybe they'd have underwear. They wouldn't feed them for the day or two before the flight, and they would make them take off all their uniforms which they could use to equip other soldiers. So they would sort of sit in their underwear naked, almost naked, unfed, on this plane, on these planes, with you know 13 hour high altitude flights and some would die, you know some would die of exposure and so when they landed in Burma they were they, people were sort of frozen they could hardly walk and still well had to feed them and clothe them and try and warm them up and keep them alive it just created among the american advisors this this kind this level of corruption made people want to support mao so the uh, a lot of the american specialists believe that um, the communist forces, because they were effective, they, were, they were, had honest commanders who were really, they weren't fighting for money. So 
a lot of the, the experts, the Chinese experts, thought that the communists would win. And so they, so in the State Department, there's sort of a variety of different views, but the people with the most information tend to be pro-Mao and anti, anti John Kaishek. And then the war, you know, then the war came to an end, and now there is a, a civil war pending in China. The war begins, and you know, Chiang Kai-shek has enormous advantages over the over the communist troops. And the, as the, in the first months of the war, the Guomindang makes exceptional progress against the communist units. And then uh, the U.S. intervened and said, "No, no, stop this, stop this." Um, and the U.S. tried to negotiate a, a, a deal between the communists and Guomindang to rule to rule a new China, some kind of deal. And be, when the war stopped, it allowed the, Chine, the Chinese to resupply, pull back to safer positions, it provided sort of a, a hiatus of three or four months where things they had a chance to, they might have lost if they had gone on, but they had a chance to get resupplied from Russia. Russia some, supplied them with uh, captured Japanese arms from Manchuria, and so they it kind of gave the communists a fighting a fighting chance. But uh, all of these issues, like why did the Americans do this? Why did they stop it? Why did they? All these became issues later on in the Cold War. When the war re, when the negotiations failed, and then the the war restarted, the the Communist Party won. The Communist armies won. And that was in uh, in 19, 1949. So, um, but even before 1949, there was there were disputes, important disputes in the State Department, and the American Counterintelligence Service, uh, the FBI. The FBI was concerned about who were these people, why were they supporting communists. They were focused on that, um, and I think that the. Um, the, the Cold War in the United States really began with the raid on what was called Amer Asia magazine. There was a, a magazine started in 1945 by the uh, American specialist on China, John Service. Let me see if I have the names of the, some of these people. Uh, I don't remember them all by name. John Service and the other people who had been assigned to China during the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, and what happened was, um, this was an extremely influential magazine on Chinese affairs. It was the most important magazine in English. And it had article after article about what was actually happening. It was a very factual oriented magazine about what was happening in China between 1945 and later. And it tended to still be pro Mao. <laughs> and this was during the Civil War period. So um, the, uh, the intelligence, American Intelligence Service decided to, to snuff this out. And this became an issue in Congress. You know, we don't want to support the communists in the war. So, and there was a FBI, there was a raid on, um, actually it was a CIA raid on, on the uh, uh, Amer Asia offices in New York. Um, there was no CIA at the time, but there was a, the OSS later became the CIA. And this was an OSS operation by a guy named Bielski, who was the, who was the leader of this department who was focused on China. So they did a raid on the, to, on the office, and they found documents uh, from um, some of the writers that had been classified secret. So these were... The, the China hands were using the work that they had done, the articles they had written to the, for the State Department, the research they had done for the State Department. This was a source for a lot of the writing after 1945 for the magazine. And now the American security apparatus was able to capture documents classified as confidential or secret uh, by the State Department that was in, the, it was in these headquarters. And so these people were all arrested um, many went. Many went to jail. Some, some longer, some shorter. All were kicked out of the State Department, um, and um, most, almost all of them had their career careers ruined. Some really escaped. 
because of mistakes made after trials later. But um, so here, here are the, some of the names: Owen Lattimore, uh, John Service, uh, Edmund Club, um, and actually Eleanor Roosevelt was <laughs> implicated um, in all this too, because she was uh, part of. Uh, she had uh, strong ties to this to that wing of the State Department. Um, uh, so it's actually. Um, Atchison from the State Department personally fired um, John, John Service. Um, and uh, some of the people who were under suspicion, they were federal employees. They had certain protections. And so they, some of them couldn't actually be fired, so they were just assigned to remote duty stations in, the, in, the, in, um, in Europe. Um, um, John, let's see. One of them was assigned to the Liverpool consulate. That's, they get rid of him. So. Um, uh, there were a couple of suicides. All right. Um, so then uh, it turned out that the, the Chiang Kai-shek lost the war, um, Mao won. And now the issue was, who can, how did this happen? Why, were we, so why was the State Department weak on this? Why were they supporting Mao, not supporting Chiang Kai-shek? What an incredible disaster. Um, the Americans, uh, China belonged to America. That was the view, right? China belongs to America. There is a fight between Japan and America for control of China. And the Japanese had their puppets, we had our puppet. And we won, the, you know, the, the Americans did all the fighting against Japan. The Soviets did very little except at the very end. But American submarines, very early in the war, began sinking the shipping. And then, you know, the Doolittle Raid, and America was very aggressive in the war. The Chinese army did very little in the war. Um, they were not effective against the Japanese. So uh, the sense in Congress was, you know, this is a war that we paid for. It's ours. We want it. China is ours. So you can't lose something you don't have, right? So who lost China? That was. Who lost China was the theme all through the 1950s into the 1960s. And it was the State Department communists who lost China. That's who it was. So that was the beginning. Uh, I think that was the beginning of the Cold War. Um, and it wasn't until later that McCarthy, sort of in, a, in an opportunist way, McCarthy wasn't an anti-communist. He was, McCarthy was personally very close to, uh, to the JFK's, the Kennedy family. There were, Irish, there were Irish there. You know, they had conservative politics. None of them were like right-wing nuts. But McCarthy saw an opening, a new issue that he could he could make a re reputation on. So he kind of developed that way. But it's odd that they had, he had very strong, close relations with the Kennedy family, Joe Kennedy. Okay. Um, that takes us up through the 1940s. Um, one of the things that happened early in the Cold War was the, was the attack on the Chinese people who supported China. Now we have the uh, victory of the revolution in China. What is, what about the Chinese people? During the 19, during the war, FBI repression against communists and really declined once, once the, once the, uh, once the Soviets were in the war. Uh, do, there's a lot less pressure, and the Communist Party, moved, I think, moved pretty far to the right. With the, you know, this was the period where everybody, you find a communist family where people had children in the 1940s. They're all named like Lincoln. The kids are named Lincoln or Washington or something. So, you know, this was a period of, of uh, acceptance of communism um, by the American government, and you know, the, the CIO was given a free hand to organize workers. Uh, in the factory, in the war production industries, the U.S. government allowed the CIO into the factories, um, and many of the, all the best CIO organizers were communists. Were really yeah. Acceptance? Yeah, I mean, they were, they were identified as communists. They were allowed to, to be the best labor organizers. Like yeah. Tolerance? Tolerated because of the alliance with the Soviet Union. Uh, yeah, this is a very important alliance. And uh, the U.S. was terrified that the Soviets could fail in the war. So there were, you know, people were doing 
not just communists, but the whole government was doing relief aid to the Soviets and all kinds of important political initiatives to help Russia um, support Russia and support Stalin in person personally. So there were just a lot of important things happening. So and this affected Chinese people, not just you know other people, other communists. So um, in Chinatown um, in San Francisco and to a lesser extent in New York, young people tended to support China and they supported the Chinese Revolution. So there were organizations of um, young people both in New York and in China. And then there were the older organizations like the Chinese Laundrymen Association, the guys who gave the ambulance to Mao. So before the, um, during World War II and before, um, it was imp because China was so poor, many, um, many Chinese families depended on remittances from their rel relatives in, in New York and San Francisco. So people would send a month monthly payments to their families in China, especially during the 30s when people were really starving in China. Uh, so there was a pattern of doing this. And uh, just as the U.S. has done recently to Iran, um, the U.S. outlawed, as part of the um, pressure against Red China, uh, they outlawed such remittances. So the Laundrymen's Association had a long published daily newspaper in Chinese in New York. It was a pretty, you know, it had a circulation about a, of about 20,000, 25,000, but it was the only paper that carried actual news from China about what was going on. So it was an important paper. It was a uh, pro-China newspaper. And the U.S. government was constantly trying to find ways to shut it down. The FBI would, and you know, uh, grab people off the street, throw them in cars, question them. Um, they would try um, try to find ways to to intimidate advertisers, not do any advertising in the newspaper. Many, many times they they detained and questioned the editor, the editor of the newspaper, who actually who ran a big Chinese laundry in New York. And so they're looking for ways to shut that down. And so what happened was, once there was no way to get remittances legally into China, people had to find illegal ways or other routes to get the money in. So there was a, a bank in Hong Kong that had ties to uh, the Chinese banking system. And so the newspaper carried an advertisement by that bank saying if you can, we can send your remittance for your family, send it to us in Hong Kong, and then we'll send it in to your family in China. Well, arguably this is circumventing the U.S. law against doing against sending money into Red China. So um, they arrested them and charged them with extremely serious offenses. They arrested um, three uh, workers who had actually sent the remittances they arrested three staff people from the uh, newspaper. And so this was a pretty important trial. It was They were defended by a pioneering black attorney, um, an ACLU you know, uh, progressive attorney, defended them um, in the trials in New York. And it was uh, uh, a pretty sensational trial, and it frightened people. Uh, every Most of them, they were all convicted. Um, there are two suicides. One guy, one of them, one of the staff jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge. Another hanged himself, um, and uh, others got you know five, ten years prison. So it's a pretty serious thing. There was a, uh, actually there's a popular movie made about this. I wonder if anybody saw this. It's called Golden Gate. Anybody see this? Um, it's an it's a late '80s movie. Maybe you can find it. I, I can picture that male actor who's the lead, but I can't think of his name. So, the movie's called Golden Gate. And to make the to make it a better movie, to uh, make it a more interesting movie, they they change the location of the of the uh, battle in New York. They change it to San Francisco. And it was um, they kind of, and the, the theme for the movie was that there was this beautiful young Chinese co-ed 
who was a Berkeley radical, who was a Berkeley student, you know, not, not, not Wendy Yoshimura, but this beautiful young Chinese radical who was going to Berkeley. And um, she was actually the daughter of, of one of the persecuted Chinese laundrymen. And there is an FBI agent. The FBI, you know, was trying to uncover who the communists were at Berkeley and root out the evil, you know, pro-China people. And so one of the FBI agents would go out to the campus, and he would talk to people. And he fell in love with this woman. Isn't that charming? He fell in love with this beautiful co-ed who lived in Chinatown. You can, in the scenes, you may recognize the streets of Chinatown in the in the movie. So they have this love affair, and you know it's one of the few FBI movies that has a happy ending, in my opinion, which is when the FBI agent jumps off the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> And that, that's sort of how he's there. His love is unrequited, and he, he jumps off the Golden Gate Bridge. It's such a heartbreaking, isn't it? Really, yeah. So, Golden Gate, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So, anyway, so that's kind of the four. I want to take a, a so, but there, aside from the laundryman's organization, there were young people's organizations, sort of spontaneous young people's organizations. Laundrymen. Um, in the 19th century, Chinese people were not allowed, were isolated, they were in ghettos, they were not allowed to participate in the economy. So they were limited to laundry service and restaurants. The only businesses you get a license for if you were Chinese. And you had to do them in Chinatown, of course. You couldn't work outside Chinatown. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. And a lot of it was really, you know, the for California at least, the Asians we were worrying about were most of Chinese because that's you know so close. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, and you know, who? Matt Dillon. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Yeah. Joan Chen. Joan Chen's great, isn't she? Yeah. Great actress. Okay. Yeah. What year was that? Can you tell? 89? Okay. So. 94. 94. Okay. So people can tune in and watch that. Uh, but there were young people's organizations in Chinatown. Um, and they were bigger in San, much bigger in San Francisco than New York. And some of them were run to church groups, actually. But there was a tremendous um, FBI uh, attempt to penetrate these groups. As the Cold War really developed uh, in the towards the, in the early fifties, the um, uh, American, uh, um, I guess he's the Consul General in Hong Kong, was a, a right wing um, anti communist, and he announced that uh, ninety percent of the Chinese people living in um, San Francisco as Americans, 90% of them were actually illegal aliens and must be deported, could be legally deported. And that's because, uh, do people know what a paper sun is, the paper sun thing? Because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, yeah, paper sun, paper sun, that's O N. yeah, yeah. Yeah, not a paper daughter, a paper son. <laughs> okay, so people use fake documents to get into the U.S. Because of the Exclusion Act, there are some narrow exceptions. If you were an immediate relative, that meaning son or daughter of a U.S. citizen, you could get in anyway. And so people would create documents in China to prove that you were the son of an American citizen, the daughter of an American citizen, and then you could get in. Now, generally, people were questioned very intensely on Angel Island. Many people were questioned for six months before they were finally let in. But people got in. Some people got in. So the, uh, the authorities, uh, the Americans decided that because there are so many illegal aliens, how many of these people are sleepers? How many are, are hidden Chinese communist agents? And how are we going to deal with this? So um, by this time, there was a very intense battle between the Guomindang forces in Chinatown and the pro-Chinese forces. 
and the pro-Chinese forces were in the minority. So um, in 19, the, when, the, when, the, when the Chinese Revolution won, the new China was announced on October 1st, 1949, the big celebration in Beijing, there was a celebration in San Francisco too. It was a pretty big, important celebration in Chinatown. Um, but for the pro Chiang Kai shek, Womindong people, this was like a life and death issue. You know, now, you know, if we let this, if we let um, China, uh, if we American government coaches up to China, we're going to lose everything. We will lose our, the Chinese will invade Taiwan. Will be eliminated. So the Guomindang felt like it was fighting for its life in Chinatown. So they, uh, Guomindang, uh, 20 or 30 Guomindang thugs attacked the meeting to celebrate the People's Republic, beat people very severely. The communists and, and pro China people fought back, but it was a big melee and very famous. And then after the meeting the next weekend, the Guomindang put up wanted posters all over Chinatown with a list of 30 people that, that they're, they're, if you assassinate this, kill this person, you get a reward. So they put up posters demanding the, uh, the murder of the leading pro-China people, especially those connected with that the celebration event in Chinatown. So that kicked off. That really, that kind of a battle kicked off the next 20, 30 years of the battle in Chinatown between you know, uh, progressive pro-China socialist people and the Guomindang. And it, it, it broke down generationally because the Chinatown had been controlled by the so-called six companies, which are the six main family ruling elites in Chinatown. They control, uh, the, their main business is, was really lo loan sharking um, and but because Chinese people couldn't get loans from banks, so loan sharking. But all the rackets, the conventional, you know, rackets, they ran all of those, um, and um, and then they actually so they accumulated real more and more property. You know, they, be, they became more and more conventional. So now much of the property in Chinatown is owned by these people, by these conservative people. But there's, I'll, I'll get to it later. But they have shifted their allegiance. Most of them have shifted their allegiance to China now. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yes. Because there's no business with Taiwan anymore. If you're a businessman, you have to make money. You need to make money in China. So it's very mixed now. But uh, the, you know, the business types in Chinatown, nobody in their right mind would be anti-China, openly anti-China. Yes, they have kept it. You know, there is a Taiwan association. They have... You know the Taiwan Blue Shirt Youth Group, uh, but it's very small, and there are anti-China demonstrations occasionally. The the Guomindang, the Guomindang has a security service operating. Their uh, IBMD, the uh, Foreign Intelligence Service for Taiwan, is, operates in Chinatown. That's uh, very effective in Chinatown. So they, um, you know, they will demand that you, if it's an important event where you, they need an anti-China demonstration, they'll do it. Um, there are Protestant church groups in Chinatown that are quite old. Um, in, in the uh, 19th century, um, a lot of uh, uh, liberal Protestant groups were shocked by the conditions of people living in Chinatown, especially the, uh, the abuse of women and children in Chinatown. The uh, prostitution was a, a brutal institution in Chinatown in the 19th century. And so a lot of the churches penetrated the Chinese community by providing relief from the, the, the worst social abuses, the poverty, you know, the abuse, the, the gambling and the rackets. They provided some, some support um, for people. Yeah, I'm talking about 1890s, 1880s, yeah. So, so there is a, people join these churches and there's still, you know, the family after family have remained parts of these churches, and these are important. The churches still provide, uh, like the Presbyterian Church in Chinatown on Stockton Street. That is um, 150 years old. I actually, I had a trial where the pastor was my witness on Thursday, last Thursday. So it's in a pretty important uh, church. 
uh, and uh, with very long ties. So there are church communities, and then there are you know the you know in the '70s there was a rise of sort of right wing churches in the U.S. and there's some of that in Chinatown too. But when the Guomindang needs to turn out people for an anti-China demonstration, they kind of appeal to their churches, to their churches. The big liberal churches in Chinatown and Presbyterians don't go. But the smaller churches, they pay the pastor, you know, we'll pay them $10 a head for every person they can turn out. And churches are struggling, right? They depend on, they're like uh, our organization here, they depend on donations. So, um, but they, uh, so they get, I've seen demonstrations of, uh, uh, sort of elderly churchgoers and going down demonstrations many times in San Francisco where people just have no idea what the issues are and could care less. It's sort of an outing because they get a bus ride from the church to wherever the demonstration is. There's a nice outing there and there's some people shouting slogans. It's all Chinese people. It's kind of nice for Chinese people. And, uh, and then afterwards they all get to go shopping. Uh, the, the secret, the security service pays for a shopping trip. So they all get on the bus and they get to go to a kind of a shopping place you can't go to. It's outside of Chinatown, some kind of nice place that has Chinese stuff that they that they want. So it's kind of a nice outing. So they're they're still doing that. Yeah. You know, this is really a great discussion. <laughs> I, I couldn't get out yesterday, so I'm glad I did. So I came back from China. I was here for quite a while, and before Xi Jinping, there was a lot of discussion among people about what good was. Chiang Kai shek anyway. And he would have some defenders and opponents. I mean, China's not as rich as you think it is that way. I'm talking about now in Beijing. Okay, yep. Let me oh, get back to you. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a question. Okay. No, I'm almost I actually there isn't that much how long have I yammered on? Not that long. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let me do that. So so there is this uh there is pretty intense uh FBI uh supervision of the, especially of the younger people. Um, in the 1950s and the beginning, the late 1950s, who were in these pro-China church organizations or, and social groups, um, the the main there there is one pretty large one, and through by interrogating every single member of the group again and again and again, the FBI destroyed the group, uh, and so that so there is a lull until the. You know, the rise of uh, radical politics in the 1960s revived Chinatown, revolved, uh, re revived the leftists in Chinatown. One important figure I want to mention is Maurice Chuck. I don't know if people know who he was, but Maurice Chuck, I think, is kind of the great hero of uh, Chinatown leftist politics. Uh, he was a, he ran a pro, the only really uh, effective. He ran the only, I would say, pro-China newspaper in Chinatown. It was a daily, and um, it w carried um, articles from the Chinese press. And he he used the the very best China scholarship, uh, China experts who were pro-China to write for the newspaper. Um, among them, let's see. If I can get their name right, Henry Liu. Henry Liu. Um, one of the these two characters, Henry Liu and Maurice Chuck, are very important figures in uh, the history of San Francisco Chinatown. So, because of Maurice Chuck's newspaper, he was an immediate target of the counterintelligence service in the U.S. So they were constantly following him and threatening his advertisers and doing everything they could. To shut him down, and uh, he, but he developed a cadre of supporters, especially among you know older people who were interested in China and among young people, sort of a rising '60s generation. And he was he he made it through the '50s. He was publishing in the 1960s, and um, actually, Maurice, the, there's an organization called the U.S. China People's Friendship Association, which I'm a member. That was founded in Maurice Chuck's basement. <laughs> That's where we founded it. Yeah, and, and that was really late. That was in like 1970. Um, where was it? Hmm? Where did you do that at? Maurice Chuck, the where publisher. Was 
In San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. I'm only talking about San Francisco now. Maybe a little daily city, from, you know, like, but I'm talking about San Francisco. Um, so he uh, was a constant voice of the left in, in Chinatown and opposed, um, before China was successful, became successful economically, the Guomindang just controlled everything in Chinatown and had the support of the FBI. But um, I wanted to talk about the, some of the repression that everybody felt concerning the paper sun issue, okay. Um, as part of the repression against, um, uh, against the left in Chinatown, this um, promotion, from, promotion of the idea that there were thousands of sleepers in uh, working for the, the Chinese Secret Service in Chinatown, um, the uh, FBI became very alarmed and was ordered by the political authorities to suppress this, find out who these agents are, or round them up, get rid of them. So there had just been this, this happened after that great big battle in, uh, over the founding of the People's Republic of China, where the Guomindang and the communists fought in that hall. And so the Guomindang allied with the FBI, of course. They provided important informers for the FBI. And when the FBI decided to try and find out who the sleepers were, of course, there really weren't many, but they thought there were thousands, um, the Guomindang helped them. So the Guomindang developed this policy with the FBI and the Immigration Service that everybody who was a paper son, everybody who came here illegally through a fake relative, you should all turn yourselves in to the immigration service. It's the patriotic thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. So hundreds of people that they had influence over turned themselves in to the immigration service. Well, anybody who had a background that they, the police, secret police didn't like, they were gone. They just got kicked out. And their whole family got kicked out with them. And uh, other people... Uh, who the FBI, who the secret police weren't really interested in, they were like in a very sort of a difficult status. You know, the, they were not like really Americans anymore, but they were not being deported. Maybe they were deported, but it was suspended. So they just created this chaos in the Chinese community. And it, they, the, it made the Guomindang look like really incompetent people. We never should have trusted these people. So it really politically, that one thing really damaged the Guomindang's authority over the masses of people in Chinatown. It was such a stupid thing to do. Um, but through all this, um, uh, Maurice Chuck was publishing, and uh, uh, I just want to sort of skip ahead a little bit, but his, there was a, a writer, um, a Taiwanese guy named Henry Liu, and Henry Liu uh, actually knew uh, uh, Zhang Zhongguo. Zhang Zhongguo is the son of John Kaishek. He was the son, he's dead now, but he was the son of John Kaishek. And because the, uh, Taiwan was a police state, especially then, um, the security service was run by John Zhongguo. So the security service, you know, Taiwan's not like a big country like the US, so John Zhongguo personally hired every agent for the, uh, for the Taiwan security service. And one of the people he hired was a, jur a, a, a Taiwanese journalist, intellectual guy named Henry Liu. He was a really great, effective journalist. And so he hired, he hired Liu, and uh, he worked in the Taiwan intelligence service at a pretty high level and knew John Zhongguo very, very well. But he kind of got upset with the corruption he saw. He was upset with the corruption, the dishonesty of the service, the things it was doing. And so he said, well, he went back to, he quit and went back to journalism. But now he had all this inside information about what was happening in Taiwan. So he was hired by Maurice Chuck. And his articles were the sensational. That's the reason why people bought Maurice Chuck's newspaper, because they had a great writer like him. And he would had all these stories about about it. So 
Uh, this drove the Taiwan Security Service crazy. It was really an upsetting thing for them. So um, they were uh, constantly battling them, trying to find ways to destroy them. Um, uh, eventually, they decided just to kill the guy, <laughs> just to kill Henry, just to kill Yo. So um, what they did was, uh, I think it was, in, it was in the 80s. Um, when did they kill him? Um, around 85. I'll, I'll get you the date in a minute. But uh, what they did was he, he had a house in Daly City. He lived in Daly City. And, uh, you know, most security, a practice of security agencies around the world is it's better if your own agents don't do the murder. So what you want to do is you want to hire thugs if you can do to carry out things really if you're operating like the the Guomindang in a friendly country like the US if you get caught murdering people there it's going to damage it's going to damage your association with the with the FBI it's going to damage your relationship with the FBI if you get caught the newspapers find you did crap like that so what they did was they used the criminals to hire thugs it's called the bamboo gang <laughs> were the thugs that they hired to kill Henry Leo. So he had a couple guys on bicycles outside his house in Daly City. And when he came up, they brought him and you know, shot him to death with pistols. And then they rode the bike down, put him in a van, and they just drove off. And uh, the, uh, the FBI investigated this, and they couldn't figure it out. Oh, my God, no. We just, you know, they, you know how the FBI, they're very thorough, right? They investigated, they investigated, they couldn't tie it to the Taiwan security apparatus. This didn't feel. But two Daly City detectives did. The case was solved by two local Daly City detectives. They investigated. But the thing is, they really investigated. And it took them a long time, but they figured out who did it and how. And it was an incredible embarrassment to the FBI. And, and it was a big embarrassment in Congress. So part of the fallout from this was that the, the, uh, Congress passed legislation that said the FBI cannot work with the IBMD anymore. All these cozy relationships you have with the Taiwan security police, that's over now. You blew it. We want these guys out of the country. So it created a lot of pressure on the Taiwan security service, kind of backfired. Um, but they're, of course, they still operate, <laughs> and they're probably still pretty close to the FBI. But you know, but who knows what those characters are up to? Um, the thing that really caused his murder was that Leo published a book. On, he published a biography of John Jungwo, the son of John John Kashak. It was that book. When that book was published, exposing all the dirt and crimes that they had that he had done, that's why they carried out the murder. So that was the thing that really triggered. His murder in Delhi City, huh? He was Chiang Kai Shek's son, and he, had, you know, Chiang Kai Shek wanted his son to run the security service. That's the surest route to hold power. Okay, um, I guess my last part. I want to talk about the rise of the left in Chinatown, uh, in based on the um, the new left and uh, the rise of uh, left wing politics in America. Uh, because of uh, principally because I think because of the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement, those two things, civil rights and the uh, anti-war movement, led to a revival of left politics in the United States, and it led to a revival in Chinatown too, of course. Um, the model for many revolutionary-minded students in the '60s, their model, you know, the ties with communism had really been broken by the Red Scare and the anti-communist propaganda of the 50s and in the 60s. And so the new left was created kind of as an uh, outside of the traditional communist movement. Uh, rejected the Communist Party, took, a, you know, a, uh, um, you know the issues, the issues like Czechoslovakia and identify with the youth movement and things like that. So it's a very mixed bag. But among more radical leftists, um, the principal set of politics that the new left embraced was the politics of the Black Panther Party. And the Black Panther Party had, you know, an extremely radical orientation uh, towards American politics. 
and in, in terms of um, political theory, the theory of the Black Panther Party was that uh, black people in the United States are an internal colony. Of, and they are oppressed by imperialism. The same way that China was oppressed by imperialism and the same way that Vietnam was being um, uh, oppressed by imperialism. So the same kind of tactics would, na would naturally apply. Mao's revolutionary warfare tactics, suitable for an oppressed colony fighting against an oppressor, this kind of military tactic would be appropriate in the US. So the militarism uh, of the Black Panther Party, we're gonna, we have guns to fight the police. We're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we're going to protect our community. We're an armed, militant, revolutionary, Maoist type organization, and that was the, that was the, they were cut off from conventional politics, and that was the politics, conventional communism, and that was the politics they embraced. You know, the Communist Party, um, the traditional Maoists like the Revolutionary Union. Um, Rejected that, of course. They had a much more uh, conventional um, uh, communist perspective. The Communist Party rejected that, of course. The Trotskyists rejected that, of course. But the New Left was independent of all these other older communist co communist trends. So the organization in Chinatown, the spontaneous organization of young students, and it was students like the like in Golden Gate, the beautiful co-ed from Berkeley. Um, Berkeley actually, Berkeley radical students actually were essential in creating the new left in Chinatown. And they adopted a, the Black Panther line, that Chinese people were an internal colony uh, of the United States. And it kind of makes a little more sense. It makes it, there is a concentration of Chinese people in Chinatown that they live there, it's a ghetto, it's an oppressed nationality. So it, for a young student who doesn't have a, doesn't understand, you know, Lenin's writings on the national question, it, you know, it kind of it makes sense. And it has a revolutionary perspective. And, you know, and also I think the fact that, you know, the, the murder, the, the organized systematic murder of Asian people in, uh, during the Vietnam War, I think that powerfully promoted, you know, revolutionary thinking. Um, the Chinese community in Chinatown. So what's interesting about it is that um, in this movement began really in the 1960s. The first really revolutionary-minded group uh, outside of the student organization was called the Red Guard. And the Red Guard was had the same kind of line, Black Panther line. It was a relatively um, small group, but it was very... Uh, uh, it was very well known. Its members were aggressive, and it was completely different than you know uh, conventional leftist politics had been before. And then there was a parallel group in New York City's Chinatown, and that was called I Wor Kun I W K. That was the name of the New York City group, and uh, they had the same kind of influence. They became more and more, and they grew quickly in the late 1960s. Uh, this is the period of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and so uh, they picked up steam. And then one of the things that they did was uh, sort of a, a sort of a social opposition to the humiliation of Chinese people. IWK in New York did a campaign against tour buses so that you know, all these white people coming into our community to gawk at all the poor people they thought this was going to be great, you know. When they did that, the merchants went nuts, you know. All those white people coming into Chinatown, it's how they paid the bills, actually. Yeah. So it turned, kind of backfired. But, you know, they, it's sort of like the misunderstanding that, you know, the new left had of how things really work. Anyway, the, the two groups, Red Guards and Nadia, Nadia became merged. Uh, and they became, so the... Group in Chinatown became IWK. There was another group of people, of radical people, really from Berkeley, who had moved to San Francisco to do organizing in Chinatown. And they're like the Asian Student Union people from Berkeley in the 1970s. Uh, and 
they kind of didn't buy, didn't agree with the internal colonial line, but maybe it was right, maybe it wasn't. But they were, they were interested in doing sort of a conventional organizing, in a more conventional organizing Chinatown. And then, of course, um, the Revolutionary Union, now the RCP, that started in San Francisco. Actually, when I was, uh, when, uh, I was an army organizer uh, during the Vietnam War, when I got out, party headquarters was in San Francisco, so I, that's how I ended up here. I moved here because party, his party headquarters was a P.O. box on Grand Avenue. So that's, actually my office ended up being on Grant years ago. Anyway, so that, the RU had a much more traditional, they were Maoists, but they were, they saw themselves as part of the international communist movement. They completely rejected FOCO, guerrilla theories. They wanted to, you know, their focus was on organizing the working class. And the first RU collectors were in Richmond in the oil industry. So they, you know, it was a, they were trying to reorientate the left towards the working class. And they ended up having the greatest influence among the, the Berkeley students who did not join the Red Guard or the WK thing. So people might remember the International Hotel. People remember that? Yeah? Okay. That was a Filipino it was a hotel or, um, that changed hands many times. And each, it was on, it's on a very valuable strip of property on Kearney Street in Chinatown. And if you could tear it down and build something nice there, like a hotel, you can make a fortune. So every landlord would try and get rid of the hotel. But the hotel had uh, SRO housing for Asian people. So it had uh, mostly Filipinos, but also had Chinese people in it. And in the basement, of the International Hotel were the headquarters of these contending communist Chinese groups, IWK, and then the ACC, the Asian Community Center, under the influence of the uh, uh, RU at the time. So I remember, you know, I'd, I'd go to Chinatown to do something for the party, I don't know what it was, but you know, there were two doors that led into the, that led downstairs into the basement, and the doors were separated um, by that. So if I wasn't careful, I would walk down the wrong, walk into the wrong. Several times, I was in a hurry, I wasn't paying attention, and I walked into the IWK basement, and people would like freak out. I thought, they're going to kill me. So, I mean, that's how bitter the rivalries were in Chinatown. So I'd run back and then run into the ACC side and look behind me, and you know, it was that kind of crazy thing. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, a lot of this faded. Uh, uh, IWK eventually uh, merged with uh, ATM, in the August 29th movement, uh, based on the great August 29th, 1969 demonstration of Latinos, Chicanos, in Los Angeles against the war. Um, and then um, uh, there is um, uh, J-Town Collective, which was a Japanese Asian group in Japantown. Um, yeah, and then uh, who else? A League of Revolutionary Struggle. Um, yeah, there was another group I came from, Getting Together, okay, yeah, 1969, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, they had an unhappy, LRS had an unhappy ending, um, they, uh, they became a, uh, um, they were, the way they were organized is they had a, they had like a small number of open members and the rest of the, the rest of the cadres were orders. So it was organized that way. It was organized like a, to, um, a way a group would do secret work, not open political work. So it had an odd kind of, um, organizational form. And then the leader of the group, um, um, Got a job. His name is Gordon Chong, and he got a um, um, a job. Well, on the West Coast, Gordon Chong, um, and he got a. Um, he was trying to get a job uh, in the um, at Stanford University. Um, there was an opening for the uh, a full time Asian American uh, professor at Stanford, and you know he was in the running for the job, 
And then to a right-wing elements at the university figured out, wait a minute, this is this communist guy from Chinatown. University can't hire, hire this guy. And he was the leader uh, in Chinatown. So the um, LRS took the, so he said, well, I'm not a communist. No, no, you should hire me. I'm, I'm not a communist. And, LR, and so LRS took the position that, um, you know, this, this controversy about whether they're communists or not really kind of disrupted the organization. Um, eventually, they denounced, they rejected communism. Um, and then um, um, in third, at, when they dissolved in 1990, um, they urged members to join the left wing of the Democratic Party. That's what they decided to do. Yeah. So that's, you know, so they could have had an unhappy ending. They're still um, pretty important in Chinatown. Um, they run the, uh, they still control the Chinese progressive organization, which is tied into the Democratic Party, um, and very successfully so, I should add. And they're able to get positions from uh, city government. They run a lot of social services in Chinatown with, with the city money, housing, other important things. And uh, they're, um, they're sort of players. They, they denounced, um, back in 1989, they denounced China. They, so they supported the American view of the Tiananmen demonstrations. They said, it was a, they said it was a progressive thing. And they have supported some anti-communist, anti-China things since, but they, but they don't do it publicly because it'll upset people in Chinatown. But they want to remain the Democrats. What stance is Tiananmen? They, they supported the American government's condemnation of the Tiananmen massacre, right? Don't forget, the massacre. So, yeah, so that kind of, that differentiated them from the left in Chinatown after that. So they still go on. Okay, let's see. Anything up till today? Um, ACC became under the, was under the control of the RU, uh, Revolutionary Union, later RCP. I knew, I knew the leadership of IWK because I had to deal with them. For, uh, uh, I had an important, had a high party post uh, uh, towards the end, and I had to deal with people. I mostly dealt with New York, though, because um, I, didn't, I don't really remember the names. We had these terrible, you know, it, because there was so much factionalism, we had these terrible names for our, our opponents, who are really, really our allies. And we always referred to the IWK person as the Dragon Lady. And I forgot her real name, but she was from New York. Very talented person. Um, and uh, I, and then sometimes they would deal. They had a really, uh, I, uh, LRS had a really effective Japanese cadre who lived in Japantown, and I would deal with him a lot. But I didn't know, I didn't deal so much with the local Chinese people. Um, I mostly dealt with him for some reason. Um, but you know, the RU uh, dissolved. The RCP turned so far to the left. It's kind of an anarchist group, I would say now, a Mao Maoist anarchist. Almost, as, I would say they're syndicalists, but they're so anti-working class <laughs> you can't say they're syndicalist either. Um, so I think we're about up to the current time. The French Association still exists. We're, the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association still exists, and I'm part of that even to this day. I'll just say one more thing. I don't want to talk about the the stuff, the '90s, what happened in the '90s. There. But I just want to talk a little bit about the FBI and, and the things that they have been up to. Um, they, the, FBI in, the FBI squad um, that handles Chinatown is extremely incompetent. Um, they have made a, done a lot of really uh, unprofessional sort of crazy things. Um, the, way they op the way they operate day to day is that they have uh, white agents who speak who speak Cantonese so I walk through the community and sort of check in with people how you doing and hey what's happening and you know so they use kind of that ground pounding kind of day-to-day -day intelligence that every service does I guess uh, the two agents in the 90s were named Tony Lau and Steve Keys uh, and they're and they were actually Chinese guys but they were replaced by white people uh, later so they would um, they would work with the Guomindang um, agents, the Guomindang security agents, sort of.
and work together, exchange information on what was happening in Chinatown. Um, the murder of Henry Liu disrupted that, and that probably that's probably why Keyes was reassigned and Tony got reassigned. Uh, who knows? Um, but the people were actually convicted and went to prison over the murder of Henry Liu. Um, um, there was a, a Southern California Republican donor named uh, Katrina Long. Do people remember this story, Katrina Long? She was a, an important donor. Uh, she was Chinese. Um, she was arrested. She had given lots of money to the Republican Party. And she had... Um, she was uh, arrested in uh, 1993 or 1990. Um, I'm sorry, she was arrested on April 9th, 2003. Um, she was charged with being a double agent. Um, she was working for the FBI. She was a, an informant for the FBI. and But she had very high level contacts in China, including Jiang Zemin, the president of China. So she'd be in China a lot. And then she would come back and she'd make a report to the FBI. But what happened was she developed a, um, a relationship with the FBI agent controlling her. Um, her name was J.J. Smith. So they had this sexual dalliance. And during one of these, you know, well, they were in a hotel room and then somehow the secret documents in his, in his case ended up getting photographed somehow by her, and they ended up with a Chinese service. So it created a kind of a, you know, thing. And then, but they, so they had another agent, he did the same thing, he had sex with her. So the whole thing kept, just kept unraveling because of the incompetence and corruption of the, of the particular FBI agents involved. And they ended up losing the case. It was just unbelievable. They had her dead to rights, you know, and, but they ended up blowing it. And there are other cases like that. So the FBI, the China squad had an, a record of incredible incompetence in Chinatown. It's, I don't know much about the FBI except in Chinatown, but they're just really a bunch of losers. <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm okay. Okay, so I'm going to set this going from this side. And I'll tell on behalf of Rich, our goal is to raise to raise the microphone. Yeah. Our goal is to raise $75, and some will pay more, some will pay less, average $6. Hopefully some people will be generous. So anyway, uh, why don't we just go to question and answer right away while this is going on? So because we are already at 12. Uh, Sharon, you want to start with the question? I usually go with the line, but... <laughs> Hello. Yeah, let's follow that. Okay, so we'll start from that side because, okay, go from this side. Okay, Karen, you're the first one. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Karen is not uh, the one, so Norma. I already know everything. I don't need it. Okay. Gigi. What I was wondering is when the, the people uh, that, signed the papers, whatever, and came over, said they were related to somebody here. And then you said, all these people said, oh, yeah, I cheated and all got sent back. Why would they say that? They said that because the, um, the woman Dong told them to. That, you know, their political leadership in China that they trusted, the conservative woman Dong leadership said, if you do this, we will work out a way for you to stay legally. It's kind of, yeah. Come okay, clean. Gotcha. Okay. Come clean, come forward, no. confess this, and we'll do No, no. It, not that many actually got, you know, a lot of people didn't do it, but the, oh. the poor suckers who did, they got in a lot of trouble. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Okay. It was a minority, a small minority yeah. that actually was, you yeah. know, trusted them okay. enough to do that. We have only half yeah. an hour, so just keep moving. Shut up. You're next. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things to say, yeah. if, if that's all right. So first of all, thank you very much for this history. <laughs> and um, I know we're, we're talking about the United States, but I just wanted to say a couple of things about the Chinese history. So the, most people don't know that the Second World War started in 1937 when the Japanese 
occupied large swaths of northern China. And I think you're absolutely right that the about what you said about the U.S. The, it, it was theirs, right? The U.S. ruling class. It was, China was, is ours, right? And we won it in the Second World War, so how dare they, how dare these people have a revolution and install a, a communist government? But I just wanted to mention when you were talking about the history of the, mil, the military history in the South, and especially Yunnan province. So when I was in Kunming, I'm so glad I was there. And I met people who told me, they would say, oh, you're American. Oh, we people here really love Americans. Of course, all Chinese love Americans. But we especially do because the United, the U.S. troops stopped the Japanese outside of Kunming. And they never occupied Kunming. So the U.S. actually had to, you mentioned they sent money and they were so frustrated with Chiang Kai-shek. But they actually were troops that they finally stopped the, uh, the, the Japanese uh, advance to the south. And so I think that's important military history. Um, also, I recommend that, and I assume ch tourism to China will open up again eventually. And I recommend people go to Nanjing. If you're in Nanjing, you should go to the preserved, uh, they have the, the, the building that was Chiang Kai-shek's uh, forces headquarters in 1948, where the Maoist for Mao tried to get the Chiang Kai-shek to make a deal for a, uh, some kind of unity government. And they have the clock stopped. This is all for the tourists, of course. The clock is stopped at the time when, when Chiang Kai-shek stupidly um, rejected the deal. With, um, I think it was Zhou Enlai was the person who was the emissary. And they have a, a big portrait or big draw, um, painting of them trying to negotiate and convince um, Chiang Kai-shek that they should take the deal. So I think, and I it, probably the Americans were the ones who said, don't take the deal, we're going to win. Right? <laughs> we're going to beat the, those uh, communists. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to say was... Um, there was a book written by Iris Chang, the dear sister, um, called The Thread of the Silkworm. Have you read that? Yeah. So this is about a man who was um, a Chinese American who was um, a, a great scientist, and he was hounded out of this country, and he went back to China, and he became the father of their... Um, Advanced military missile system. Silkworm. Thread of the silkworm, right? It's a very good book. Can I ask you one thing? Tom, I have a. Okay. You said something about Google who owned China in 37. Who did you say? In 1937, the Japanese occupied huge parts of right. northern China. Right. Well, Manchuria. And Manchuria. Okay, that's correct. Right. And, and, you know, then advanced to the south, and one of the things they did was murder 300,000 people in Nanjing in six weeks, which was documented by the fam in the famous book, The Rape of Man Nanjing. Right. And that, that author, Iris Chang, also wrote the book called The Thread of the Silk. What I'm asking is that you said there was some debate between about who owned the, uh, the area, well, that was what the United, United States or China. Yes, that, that's what David said. I was just saying I thought that was correct. After the war, after the after uh, Chinese communists took power, there was all this big hoo-ha in the United States about who had lost China. Around who what owned year? It. Around what year? Ni 1945. And, and okay, let's move on. Can I just, I, I want to talk about Iris Chong for a minute because it's uh, it's another FBI screw up, I think. But anyway, uh, she was sort of, a, she's in Taiwan, she was sort of a conventional liberal, I guess. But she started learning about China and she wrote several books about China. And then uh, Threat of the Silkworm, um, you know, uh, is a book about the, the scientist who had been deported by the years an important I can't think of the name now, but there was an important Chinese scientist who 
developed the American um, mi missile system. He worked on, nu on nuclear physics for the Americans. And he was um, hounded out as a spy during the Cold War. And so he was, he returned to China and he, you know, he helped build the, the nuclear industry and the missile systems, including the Silkworm missile, which was an important military export for China. It's an effective anti-ship missile. And, and also it can be used on land, but it was uh, a missile that he helped design and, and it was important for the export of arms, but for China providing hard currency. But I want to talk about her. They, she became kind of a pariah with liberals as she came, became more and more pro-China. And her books became progressively more pro-China. And she began to be attacked. She was so dumbfounded personally by these attacks on her. And you know, she, she really developed mental problems from the strain, I think. But so she pretty much, you know, people believe that she had, you know, mental illness towards the end. But well, her yeah. She committed suicide. She committed suicide. Yeah. But people, so initially people said, oh, she was just overcome with, with the, the horror of what she was writing about, of the rape. Mm -hmm. But actually, her husband says that it was a long standing mental illness that finally caught She was hounded by the FBI, too. And I think, in my personal opinion, that's what triggered her suicide. Because she did not expect that. But at the end, she was had in, you know, she pulled off Highway 17, you know, you know turned off and shot herself through the chin, through the chemist her head. But it, you know, it, I don't, I don't deny that she was depressed, but I think that the um, harassment by the FBI really shook her. That's something she didn't expect. Yeah. Okay. Use the microphone. This is going to get back to the FBI. Okay, so I was at the funeral and I knew Iris, so I asked her, why did you write Thread of the Silk Room Worm? She said the publisher found her and, and commissioned her to write it. So I suspect that they were trying to put the subject out there. It's a Shen Shui Shen, okay, who was lucid until he was 99 years old in Taiwan. So if they get her to write this book, right, uh, there were also two AP reporters, and they wrote the China Cloud. So um, the mood was to try to get intelligence on China's nuclear program. So having those books out there, then they would be able to, you know, surveil who comes out of the woodwork around this book. So it's very odd that her suicide is two weeks apart from. Um, Webb, the one who wrote um, the Iran Contra, Dark Webb. Yeah, Gary, uh, Gary, Gary Webb. Gary. They're two weeks apart. Okay, Rich. Rich. Richard gets the microphone. FBI. Uh, just a little bit off the subject. Could you talk about uh, the impact on San Francisco politics generally? My impression is that Nancy Pelosi has been a supporter of the Kuomintang all the, all the way through. And I don't know about other politicians, Willie Brown, for instance. And um, the, um, well, yeah. But, uh, you know, the mainstream politicians. And um, what was Mueller's role in this? Did, was the head of the, yeah, I'm just curious. The way I can know what the head of the FBI was thinking or the FBI leadership was thinking, I have no idea. But... Right. I didn't, I don't think about them. Yeah. That mean, I don't mean, they have a, a small unit that focuses on counterintelligence work in Chinatown. I don't, I never met them or seen, no one's ever pointed them out to me. I don't know who they are. But, but yeah. About you know, San Francisco politics are a conventionally democratic party. So that's true for Chinatown too. They're, um, to stay in business in Chinatown, I have to pay off, uh, the democratic party. I mean, it's like if I don't make political contributions that the bosses tell me to make, I don't get anything. I can pick up, if there's a problem in the office, I can pick up my phone, call one of the party bosses. There's a cop there in, in 10 minutes to take care of whatever problem I got. And he's going to, whatever I tell him to do, he's going to do. 
you know. So, but if you don't have, if you don't make the political contributions, you get nothing, and you can become sort of a pariah. And there, because it's such a small, net, everybody knows each other. Everybody knows me in Chinatown, and everybody knows each other. So if you, you know, people know my politics for sure. But if I want protection, <laughs> I have to pay for it. You know? right. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe you've been to Chinatown when the the kids do the the dragon dance thing, and they, they go to the office and they like the firecrackers. Okay, when they do that, I just had that happen a month ago. You have to. My wife said, "Get the money, get the money, get the money." So I gave fifty bucks and to them, and then they went away. If you don't get make that voluntary contribution, you come in to work the next day and your plate glass window's broken. Yeah. Huh? The kids and oh, yeah, I have an office in Chinatown. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the war. I lived in China. There was a foreigner's bookstore until very recently. And before Xi Jinping took office, there was a lot of open discussion. It was nowhere near as authoritarian as it is now. And there were people that wanted to talk about the war. Because the uh, Second World War. That's the, I was in Beijing. But there were the people who defended Chiang Kai-shek. And this is one of the ways they defended him. He, he was awful. He didn't do any good for anybody. But there were many commanders in the Guomindang who really tied up the Japanese forces a great deal. I mean, Chiang Kai-shek was not the only, he was the leader, but there were many effective military people in that army, and they were well-funded, and they pointed out that the, that the Japanese were for, very frustrated and forced to use a lot of military people because of the overwhelming number of Chinese people. And people even went to say that one of the reasons why Nanjing was so awful was that the Japanese really expected the Chinese to roll over and play dead. And instead of rolling over and playing dead, many of the people in the Guomindang effectively resisted the Japanese, and this is going against the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek. And the Japanese were very frustrated, just as the Germans were very frustrated in Russia, because the people really hated the occupation. And to dismiss, I mean, it's true, uh, Mao was much more effective, but to dismiss the role of the Guomindang is really to miss the dynamics of the major portion of the war, which was south and west. And um, I, I mean, he, he, as awful as he was, the Guomindang was not that bad. I mean, as awful as the leadership was, Yuri, I mean, it's a good point that they made. And uh, they did, they did tie up the, most of the Japanese forces. Yeah, that's yeah. Hey, Rich. Okay, so that person behind. Uh, um, KMT massacred the communists in Shanghai in 1927, and then in the 37, the Japanese entered Beijing at the Marco Polo Bridge. But David and I have a common friend. I wish Norman Young was here. He knows the the FBI knows him well, but. The reason the, the um, cruelty in Nanjing happened, Norman knows all the battles. When the Japanese went into Shanghai, they were massacred. Shanghai was such a bloody ma massacre that they marched. They walked from Shanghai into Nanjing and took it out on the people and women of Nanjing. Okay, the, the person behind, person behind. Let her finish. Yeah, maybe one, one thing, Raj. Uh, first of all, thank you, David. It was tremendous. Uh, I wonder if you can give references, like books and things that people can read more on the history of the Ch uh, you know, Chinatown in San Francisco. The discussion is a nice thing to do for you. I don't know anything about a book on Chinatown. <laughs> yeah. 
Gordon Chin's book is Building Community Chinatown Style. So Gordon Chin, you know, kind of is one of that generation. Okay, so China Playground. Oh, do you have anything to say? Oh, okay. I, I just a couple things. Uh, number one, I grew up in Sausalito, which is an odd thing, but anyway. Um, uh, I remember that there on Angel Island, there was a, um, uh, first of all, it was a mystery to us because when we were growing up there, we, we weren't allowed to go there. But then there was a, a, an, a place where people came and they had to be, um, I guess, were they coming from China or do you know anything about that? Yeah, it was, it was a, a sort of Ellis Island of the West. And then were they were they uh, kept out or what happened? I mean, not they were processed. Was, they were processed and they came in. Uh, some came in, some went back. Many went back. Uh huh. Papers, sun papers weren't good enough. You were on your way back. Uh huh. And the other thing is that you said about the uh, RCP that they had degenerate or become like the um, how should I say uh, anarchists of the uh, something uh, uh, currently or something like that of the against the working class? What did you mean by that? Just clarify. I'm, I'm, you're not against the working class. Oh, I it's thought you part said that. Of the RCP is part of the left. But they have, a, a, you know, I think they have uh, an extreme left orientation. I don't want to really talk too much about them, but I'm, I don't consider them to be an anti-communist group, nothing like that. They're kind of an offbeat, you know, um, ultra-left group, in my opinion. An offbeat. Okay. Yeah. I just made a quick comment. Yes. I mean, I came to the Bay Area in the end of 71. and 72, in my first job, down the peninsula, there was a Chinese who I became friends with. I forget his name. But he invited me to a Chinese uh, uh, celebration of something. I forget, maybe Independence Day of Taiwan. So it was a Taiwanese thing. And they showed a very colored movie about the war. And it was such a big propaganda. And there was a big turnout. So up to 72, I know, then I've changed jobs. I lost track of all that. But I didn't know the politics at that time. So thank you, David. So <laughs> what is the situation with the uh, uh, right-wing Chinese today? I think you've mentioned some. Are they? Do they have a pretty strong hold in Chinatown today? I think the film, by the way, was called Great Battle for China, which was really popular right around that time. Anyway. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. The, the conservative leadership in Chinatown is rooted in uh, the right wing of the Democratic Party there. So they support the mayor. They, I had to make, I had to make, I had to donate money to the mayor's campaign this, this year, last year. Uh, so uh, it's you know that's what they're they're, they're there isn't any like uh, you know they're, I don't think they're attracted to the racialist racialism the racism of the Trump. Uh, Republican, po Republican politics had this kind of a racist edge to it. I don't think it's very appealing to minority people uh, of any race. But um, so they tend to be conservative Democrats. I don't know of any right wing. I mean, aside from the connection to the intelligence services, I don't know of any other. Former you know, mayor uh, yeah. who was Chinese suddenly died of heart attack. Yeah. What was his connection to this party? He was a he was a, a long serving bureaucrat who had been a radical. Um, um, tennis rights lawyer in the 1970s, um, and you know, moved into like many leftists, moved into city government, became uh, at the head of a, I forget which agency it was, an important agency, and then was ran from then was you know stepped from that into the mayor's job. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, we have still five minutes. Any other question? We'll do by raising hands. <coughs> Rich, you haven't spoken anyway. <clears throat> uh, since I live in Oakland and gave up San Francisco 15 or 20 years ago, I used to work over there and go there a lot, but you know, in the early days of, uh, since I've been here 30 years ago, uh, but now I hardly ever go except maybe to visit your office or something. <laughs> so uh, I, I was hoping for, I guess, or whatever, a little more, every time you say China, Chinatown, if you want to talk about New York, uh, almost all the time you're talking about San Francisco. Uh, but Oakland's got a fairly developed Chinatown, probably nothing like San Francisco, but long history. 
So my question is, do you know much or not know so much? You personally don't get in the middle of Oakland like you live in San Francisco. So you see what I'm saying? Do you, is there any history here that uh, would play, would uh, kind of be part of this time period you're talking about in the uh, right, left, uh, the new war, I, I'm sorry, the Cold War uh, orientation of the people? I don't think it was significant. And, you know, the Chinese population of Oakland has increased a lot in the past 30 years or 40 years, but wasn't, you know, there had been a, there's been a, a community there for many, many, many decades, but it just didn't have the political weight. I know Jean Kwan and people around her, like you, might know more about what was happening in Oakland, but um, I don't know of any initiatives that really, aside from the connection to Cal Berkeley and the student people, lots of them moved to San Francisco to organize. Oakland Chinatown grew because of the 1906 earthquake. A lot of people came here to live to, because they couldn't live in San Francisco anymore. So it was kind of an extension of that community. And there are some um, memoirs written, but I don't know. I think the politics if just reflected what you're discussing about San Francisco. I don't think there's anything really unique about at least back then, about Oakland Chinatown politics. As related to your, just one quick comment is Agnes Medley, uh, whom you mentioned, I read one of her novels. And, uh, Daughter of Earth. Hmm? Daughter of Earth. Yes, Daughter of Earth, which is a, about the radical Indian movement also in the West Coast, which was actually in San Francisco. There is a center today called the. Uh, uh, Ghatar Memorial. Ghatar means revolution or revolt. So there was a, there is a history of Indians also, but that's not today's topic. But as Ad, Ad, uh, Agnes Medley wrote a, that book. Her, her, her Indian husband was a leader in the Indian Congress. Yes. Really important. Really important figure in Oakland. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Really important figure in, in world politics, in communist politics. Anybody else? What's, oh yeah. I guess if anybody does know a little bit more about um, what's happening, there's, there's not much here about what's happening in Oakland. There's some really important things happening in Oakland uh, politically and uh, et cetera that are hitting people. One of them is Measure Q, which is a huge parcel tax on us again, all this small, small homeowners. And one of the things is we used to have representation on the uh, Oakland City Council by uh, uh, people who were Asian. And if anybody knows any more about what's what's happening in here, you know, around at all, no, no. people, That's people, a whole other discussion. yeah, it is a other discussion. But I, I just, yeah, maybe you, because uh, it seems like we're not represented by uh, Asians uh, on the city council anymore. In, in Oakland. Well, I just came from a meeting with Jean Kwan and her husband Floyd Hune. So they're um, busy doing history of the Chinese during the gold rush up in Marysville. But um, you guys should know, the progressive Asians are in the Asian Resource Center building, so it's on 8th and Harrison. And they're filled with Asian immigrant women advocates, you know, every uh, service and political group that you can think of. Yeah. Yeah, the building, the building actually fills the whole block between 8th and 9th, Asian Resource Center. So you guys remember the Jessica McClintock campaign about how much the seamstresses got paid for sewing those beautiful wedding dresses? Anyway, they're, they're very good organizers. Oh, the other hangout for the young, um, all young organizers is called East Side Arts Alliance up on 12th. They have all kinds of programs from Palestine, but then they'll have Okinawa, Korea, Jeju. Then the other hangout is the Oakland Asian Cultural Center on top of the library in that Pacific Renaissance where the fountain is in the front. You know, they have the Moon Festival, they have Chinese New Year. And uh, so upstairs, the radical Koreans uh, do their dance and their drumming. Okay, so time is officially up. Okay, time is officially up. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Time is officially up. So do you have any final? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you, David. Excellent talk.